Testing, testing, testing. Yep, looks like we are live. We're still alive, we swear. Greetings, greetings, travelers. Hopefully you are doing well wherever you are. My name is Mike, as always. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us here on Earthshine Education. We try to do planetarium shows and get people interested in astronomy. Let's turn that down a wee bit in my ear. There we go. So what we're gonna do... ...is... Set things up for planetarium shifts. Let's get that going right now. By switching to another screen. That'll work for now. So, we're actually going to be using this software right here. Now, you can grab this software yourself. There we go. This is... Stellarium. This is an open source free planetarium software. Stellarium.org is where you want to go. I am not affiliated with it. I just like using this software. Uh, each as best we can here. So this is the sky the way it is right now outside. The sun sitting in the southern part of the sky. You'll notice there's an S at the bottom of the screen. Uh, which means to our left is an E, so there's East. To our right is a W, they're right down there, so we've got South, East, and West. It means North is right behind us, or on the, at the top of the screen, depending on how you want to orient this. Uh, so this is the way the sky looks outside right now. We're just going to go ahead and speed up time. Obviously, you don't want to do that in real life, because life is short. Enjoy things while you can. So we're going to let the scun, the sun, the scun, the scone. Yes, there's a scone in the sky. We're going to let the sun traverse the sky from east to west, which is what it does every single day. Of course, many different deities attributed to the sun. Gus in Japanese mythologies. Apollo, the sun god. Helios, the sun god. The sun is now set. You'll notice the longer wavelength reds and oranges are making it through the atmosphere now, so we get to what we call a sunset. And uh, we're going to be approaching the nighttime sky here in just a second. But before we start talking about uh, planets and stars and everything else, I want to kind of briefly step aside and talk about... Where's my thing... Hide that. There we go. Briefly, we always start off with astronomy picture of the day. So that's what we're going to do. Astronomy picture of the day, if you just type it into your favorite search engine, uh, it looks like this. The actual archive is just old school web 1.0. It's just a list. But this list is incredible. Ow. This list is incredibly powerful. Because every day there's a new photo. Every new photo, I'm going to go to August 17th from a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a picture from the Hubble of what is called the Ring Nebula. Really, really cool looking, right? Well, some of them you can click on, make it bigger. Obviously, the older and further back you go in the archive, the smaller the pictures are, because this thing goes back to 1996, and digital photos back then were pretty small. But here's a good look at the Ring Nebula, which is what's called a planetary nebula. Stars that are like our sun or smaller. We'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, when they get older, they turn into what's called a red giant star, and then the outer layers just kind of puff off into space. And you get a big cloud like this. You get some debris left over. Can we zoom in a little bit? And uh, there's a white dwarf left over, right smack dab in the middle. It's the core of a star, uh, Earth, a uh, sun-like star, I should say, uh, compressed down towards an Earth-like shape.
One second. In any case, uh, this again is the Ring Nebula. We can actually see this tonight if you know where to look, and I'll show you how to find it. Uh, let's go back to Australian Picture of the Day real fast, and let's go to the next day. Oh, also the Ring Nebula, but this one actually has multiple other telescope images overlaid on top of it. So there's the original right here. Looks like it's a little bit twisted, but uh, you see even more details. So these are all different layers of this star that have been ejected. And you see this kind of some spiraling motion right here, so you can tell the uh, axis of rotation. I mean, this is an incredible photo. Unfortunately, through a telescope, you're not going to see it this well. It'll look like a ghostly eyeball. But, uh... Of course, work needs to call right as I'm doing this. Well, let's do the best we can here. It looks like I'm going to have to cut this one shorter than I'd like, but let's get through some stuff, at least learn a little bit about the sky. Uh, this has actually been happening the last few weeks, and it's actually been getting slower and slower, I should say. Uh, the Perseid meteor shower peaked uh, the second week of August. Uh, meteors look like this. Uh, they are chunks of rock and stone flying through space that eventually hit our atmosphere. When they hit our atmosphere, they light up and turn into little streaks. People like to call them shooting stars. They are, of course, not stars. They are meteors, meteoroids, uh, burning up in our atmosphere. And we'll talk all about that here in just a second. Let's actually get on to the planetarium show, because looks like we're going to have to do this one in an abbreviated fashion. Of course we are. So, if you look outside tonight, right at sunset, you're going to see a lot of action. That's a good thing. Right at sunset, in the western part of the sky, you will see, depending on where you are, uh, Mercury and Mars really low on the horizon. Again, depending on where you live, you might not see this. There'll be satellites and stuff flying by as well. But we got Mars and Mercury really low on the horizon. Hmm. Mars actually is below the horizon at this point. Uh, Mars, we'll have to look at it uh, in a different software. Sorry. Uh, Mercury is out tonight. Very, very hard to see. Uh, it is the messenger of the gods. It's very hard to see this planet because, well, to be honest, when it's up, it's really, really dim. And it's usually really low to the horizon, so you can't really see it all that well. Now, the word planet comes from Asterisk Planetis, which means wandering star. Uh, it, the Greeks named them that. Uh, these are obviously not stars. These are planets, as we call them today. Stars are all these fixed points of light that you see in the sky uh, that don't appear to move. They are moving, but from our point of view, they are just so far away. They appear to stay in the same shapes. And, of course, various cultures have assigned different names to these shapes, and actually different shapes altogether. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans and, and various Arab nations uh, have their own constellations. There's Chinese mythology, there's Native American, uh, there's First Nations up in Canada. You name it, any culture you can think of has their own version of the sky. Uh, we happen to use the West, what's called the Western sky, uh, which is Greek, Roman, uh, Egyptian and other Middle Eastern countries, uh, all these kind of put together. So when you look at the sky, if you were able to see all the shapes and the deities that they represent, uh, it would look something like this. Uh, tonight you'll find the planet Venus, very bright in the western sky, sitting in the constellation known as Virgo, the Virgin. 
Venus, of course, it's kind of considered Earth's evil twin. Uh, it's about the size of our planet Earth, but that's about where the comparisons end. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than the Earth. It has a very thick carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, uh, which traps in a huge amount of heat. The planet is inhospitable to what we would consider human life. There is an outside chance that there is some sort of life in the atmosphere that's been in the news recently. I'm not sure if it was a mistake on the part of the various probes checking Venus, or if there's actually something going on there. But that remains to be seen if there's actually life there. At least not life that we would know. Uh, in the eastern southeastern sky, uh, you will find Saturn and Jupiter hanging out very, very brightly. They've both passed what is called opposition just a few weeks ago. Uh, Saturn at the beginning of the month was at opposition, which means it rose up right at sunset and was the brightest it could be. Uh, Jupiter, uh, the king of the planets, king of the gods, biggest planet in the whole solar system, uh, that one was at opposition just uh, two, three nights ago on the 20th, I believe. So, it is very, very bright. You can easily discern these. These will be the brightest things in the southeastern sky. Uh, the moon will rise up just a little bit later after sunset. Uh, the full moon was just a couple evenings ago, so after sunset, uh, you'll have to wait a little bit for the moon to pop up. But these will be the two brightest objects in the sky down here. Saturn will have kind of a golden color to it. And if you look at it through a decently sized telescope, you'll see the rings of Saturn. Uh, Jupiter also has rings, so does Uranus and Neptune to some extent, uh, but none of them have very young ring systems uh, filled with ice like this, reflecting back sunlight uh, for us to see here on the Earth. Uh, there is a gap in the ring system that is called the Cassini Division, named for the astronomer that found them. And there's also an even smaller gap if you zoom in really, really close. You see what's called the Enki Gap right here by my mouse tip, going all the way around this way. That is the Enki Gap. And this is Saturn. Saturn system. We'll look at it again all in 3D in just a little bit. I uh, got Jupiter hanging out down here. Boom. This is the Jovian system with four large satellites, or what are called the Galilean moons, named for Galileo Galilei. You've got Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, Io is the closest of the four, Europa is the second closest, then Ganymede, then Callisto, even though they don't look like it right now, uh, based on their positions. Uh, not visible tonight is the Great Red Spot, which was visible just the other night. Uh, during opposition, including seeing shadows of some of these moons. Uh, that is a thing you can see when you look at Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, you're looking at gas giant planets. These are huge planets that are just filled with atmosphere. There's probably some sort of solid ice or rocky core at the middle, but everything you see through a telescope at least, uh, you're just going to be seeing the gases of the atmosphere. And if you're lucky, at least with Saturn, uh, you'll see the rings of the planet. Let's see, can we zoom in a little bit more? We can. There's Io. It is a volcanic world. Uh, the, planet, the planet, this moon, uh, just doesn't look like this anymore. It's always constantly changing. It's a little too close to Jupiter. And so the gravity of the planet is slowly tearing uh, Io apart. Europa is an ice moon, which it's one of the prime candidates to find a place here in our solar system other than Earth that could harbor life. Uh, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. Uh, if it was orbiting around the sun instead of around Jupiter, we would consider it a planet. It's actually a little bit bigger than Mercury. And then we got Callisto, another one of these icy balls orbiting around Jupiter. Right over there. Okay. Now, looking at the sky, just looking for constellations, easily the two easiest ones to find are going to be in the southern part of the sky uh, and they are of course Sagittarius and Scorpius now to find them you can probably easily find Scorpius Scorpius or Scorpio looks like a big J of stars now this is a artificially done uh, sky here of course 
and it's kind of an optimum viewing so let's put it as if we were in a bigger city if you're in a bigger city you're going to see less stars because there's more of what we call light pollution so as you can see here we did get rid of a bunch of the stars and you can faintly still see there's a J of stars in the sky. That is our Scorpion or Scorpius. Scorpio. The bright J of stars, of course, being the tail of the Scorpion. The heart of the Scorpion glows a bright red. It is a red giant star named Antares. Literally means anti-Aries. It is the opposite of Mars. Mars obviously moves around. But this star has kind of a similar color tinge to it. Uh, to the left of that, you will notice a teapot shape. This teapot shape. Three stars up here, making the top. You got the little handle. Tip over the spout, and you pour out your tea. Well, two things are happening. One, this is Sagittarius, so he's actually pulling out bow and arrow back. And uh, he's trying to shoot an arrow towards the heart of the scorpion. But more importantly, these two stars straddle what is called the Milky Way. You can kind of faintly see it in here. But uh, if we let time advance a little bit more so we get darker skies, there we go. You will notice the heart of our galaxy, the Milky Way. A galaxy is a collection of stars, gas, dust, planets, lots of planets, all orbiting around a centralized core. Uh, the core of our galaxy is right in here. There's different types of galaxies. Some of them are flattened out spirals. Some of them are football-shaped elliptical galaxies. And then there's a, th a third category uh, that are called irregular galaxies, which are kind of like trashed galaxies. Some of them started out as spirals, and they collided with another galaxy. Or maybe they were an elliptical, and something came by and split them apart. Uh, so that's kind of a third generalized category. And uh, so we see the Milky Way galaxy traveling from the southern part of the sky all the way to the northern part of the sky. And that takes us to the next part of what we're going to talk about. So we talked about where the planets are. And what we can see now is that this trail, this Milky Way galaxy, travels between three really bright stars. And when you have three stars, obviously you can make a triangle. So these three bright stars are going to be almost directly above your head just after sunset they are vega deneb and altair or altair depending on how you want to pronounce it so you want to look east and then tilt your head straight back so that you're looking all the way to the top of the sky so we're looking east uh, we'll see the moon popping up this again just after sunset so this is around oh nine o'clock or so looking towards the east tilting our head back up and we're going to see three really bright stars vega will be the highest up or the furthest to the west deneb and then altair altair is the one that's most towards the south this is what is called the summer triangle and this triangle starts to rise up <laughs> as the name suggests, prominently during the summer. Now, we're kind of ending, heading towards the end of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. It's obviously winter uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And so everything's gonna switch very soon. So night after night from this point forward, you're gonna start noticing that these three stars are getting lower and lower and lower towards the Western sky, indicating that summer is coming towards a close. They will be replaced by another triangle in the winter time known as the winter triangle conveniently named uh, these three stars are in three different constellations vega is in lyra the harp deneb is the tail of cygnus the swan and altair is within Aquila the eagle there's actually a couple of other constellations that are very very dim and hard to see uh, between them but we're not going to worry too much about them so vega deneb altair now we looked at the ring nebula a little while ago didn't we the ring nebula in those pictures from astronomy picture of the day is actually not too far from vega if you can find vega you'll see there's kind of a trapezoidal shape uh, nearby for three star two stars here two stars here if you can kind of draw a line between these last two stars you can kind of get close you really need to have a telescope uh, 
uh, to be able to see it uh, in this region of the sky. Now, we're going to cheat a little bit because we're in a time crunch. There we go. Yep, it highlighted it. It's a little bit further up this way. There's the ring nebula. <laughs> you got to cheat a little bit. Now, again, if you look at it through a telescope, you're just going to see kind of a ghostly colored ring. You're not going to see any color that you see here or that we saw uh, in our astronomy picture of the day, which is not on the screen. There we go. Uh, so that is what we were looking at just a second ago. That is this right here. Or I guess if you want to look at the slightly more impressive photo of it, this is looking at not only the ring nebula that we can see, but the stuff that we can't, because our eyes aren't built for everything. Our eyes can only see what is called the visible light spectrum, and we know it as red, orange, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That is the colors of the rainbow. Go. back to Stellarium. So there's the Ring Nebula again. That is out tonight, uh, just off from Vega, uh, between these two stars, a little bit closer to this top star than the bottom one. Uh, well, there you go. Now, looking towards the north, we're going to find the North Star and kind of find our way around the sky using some other stars, because that's what's beautiful about astronomy. Once you know kind of what some of these general shapes are, you're going to be able to find your way around the sky doesn't matter what time of year, as long as you can make out some of the shapes, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, I'll be able to teach you how to do that, because uh, we're not talking about Southern Hemisphere here, because I don't live down there, and I don't really know my way around. So, looking towards the north, so the sun set over here in the west, we have Venus still up in the sky, and we see what is likely the easy, one of the easiest things to see in the sky, what is known as the Big Dipper. This is an asterism. An asterism is a group of stars that are well known, kind of like that triangle we just talked about. Uh, this is an asterism. It's a group of stars, three stars making a tail, four stars making a cup. But it's not a constellation. Ursa Major, the Big Bear, that is the constellation. This little chunk of it, the stomach and tail, uh, make up the Big Dipper. Confusingly, the Little Dipper is an entire constellation. I'm not sure why that works. I don't make the rules. I'm just teaching you how to find your way around. We're going to use these four stars of the cup and three stars of the tail to find our way around. Ready? Here we go. So, we're going to follow the arc of the tail. If you follow the arc of the tail, you arc to a star... Go this way, go this way, and then you go this way. You arc to a star named Arcturus. Good memory device, arc to Arcturus. Helpful. Arcturus is in a constellation called Boetes or Boetes. It's like a big uh, ice cream cone in the sky. It's supposed to be a dude with a scythe. and you know, He's like a farmer kind of guy. But, you know, we're not going to worry too much about that. You arc to Arcturus, and then you spike to Spica. We kind of already talked about Spica in the sense, because Spica is the brightest star in the constellation Virgo. Right down here. So we're finding our way back from north towards the southwest. Now, this trick won't be working in a few weeks, because these stars, again, are all heading closer and closer to the western horizon every single night, because as we orbit around the sun, we look at different stars at night. We'll look at the structure of our solar system in just a little bit. Let's come back to our northern hemisphere, directly north. And we're going to use the Little Dipper, uh, Big Dipper, I should say, once again, to find the Little Dipper, also known as Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and more importantly, the tail of the bear, known as the North Star, or Polaris. Now, to do that, we have to use our Big Dipper shape. So again, three stars of the tail, four stars in the cup. These last two stars, we call them pointer stars, because they will point you to Polaris. So those are kind of the memory devices that we're kind of use here. We've got arc to Arcturus, so you arc off the tail to Arcturus, spike to Spica. Okay, simple. These two pointer stars point to Polaris. Also really easy to remember. So we're going to point to Polaris. This is it. This is the North Star. It is not the brightest star in the nighttime sky. 
That is not a true... If you've heard people say the North Star is the brightest star in the nighttime sky, that they were lying. It is not the brightest star in the nighttime sky. It just happens to be conveniently located in a part of the sky where it doesn't really set. Now, depending on where you live, this may be different. What do I mean by that? Well, where I live in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, the North Star is 35 degrees above the horizon because I live 35 degrees above the, the equator. If I were to move further north, like let's say to Alaska, the North Star would be way up here. If I were to move, say, to Miami or somewhere to Puerto Rico or Ecuador, somewhere close to the equator, the North Star would get lower and lower and lower in the sky to the point where it's either right on the horizon or not even visible. Another way to find the North Star is to use this constellation over here. It looks like a three as it orbits around, the, uh, as it moves around the sky, I should say. Uh, it looks like a three, then it looks like an M, then it looks like an E, and then it looks like a W. This is Cassiopeia, the queen. Very, very vain. She upsets the gods and the nymphs, the goddesses and the nymphs. Uh, you'll see she's actually here on a throne looking at herself in a mirror because she is just so pretty. Fortunately, half the night she's upside down, holding on for dear life. Not so regal, not so pretty. Nonetheless, these two triangle shapes of stars are very, very helpful in finding the North Star once again. Uh, this time we're going to make an arrowhead out of this triangle here. And boom! Draw a line straight down the middle. North Star, once again. So why is it so important? Well, just watch as everything moves, everything rises and sets. Except for Polaris and the things that are circumpolar, uh, circumpolar, I should say. My apologies for my mispronunciation. You'll see the stars rising and setting. But Polaris stays basically in the same spot. It does wobble a little bit because of the Earth's wobble from our point of view, but... As you can see, Sun is now rising, but we're going to go ahead and get rid of the sun here, get rid of the atmospheric effect, just so that uh, we can keep looking at this as it rotates around. And again, you see stars rising, stars setting, but Polaris basically stays in the same spot. This has not always been the North Star. This is Thuban up here. This is in Draco the Dragon. Thuban used to be the North Star. As the Earth orbits around the Sun, it also wobbles on its own axis, and over time, the North Pole has kind of shifted from one side to another. This is a great circle made by the North Pole of our planet. Let's return to the current time, because, well, we to rotate back around. We're now looking west once again. Wait till the sun sets one more time. Apologies for the speed there. Let's get some atmosphere back in here so we can see a beautiful sunset. There we go. Again, if you want to treat, you want to go outside, look at the sunset. So don't stare at the sun, but watch where the sun is going down in the sky. And, uh... You'll see the planet Venus very, very clearly. Again, Mercury and Mars are out there, but they're not going to be very easily seen. But Venus can be seen for a good hour or two after sunset. and uh, Very, very bright. Very easy to see. Now, the moon did rise up a little while ago in our planetarium. And I want to talk about this part next. There it is. The moon is also up in the planetarium now. Uh, there is what's called the plane of the ecliptic. Now, this is a line that the sun the moon, and all the planets appear to travel from our point of view here on the Earth. This is the line the sun goes on. Happens that the moon relatively follows the same line, and all the planets, as you can see, are kind of lined up on this line as well. So what's so important about it? Well, 
when it comes to making calendars and when it comes to figuring out the seasons this is hugely important the sun travels through 12 it's actually 13 but we're going to ignore the 13th one 12 constellations in the sky we call them the zodiac constellations you've heard me say a couple of them already virgo is one of them we talked about we've also got libra the scales You've got Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. These are all constellations in the sky that the sun travels through. So, of course, the moon and the planets do as well. 12 months of the year, 12 constellations. Now, looking at the planets in classical astronomy. Now, this is not how we look at things today. The sun is a star. The moon is a rock orbiting the Earth. Call it a satellite or a moon, and then we have other planets in our solar system. Long ago, people didn't understand that, and they just called all seven of these objects planets. And which seven am I talking about? I'm talking about the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are all seven bright objects that you can see moving throughout the sky pretty much on a daily basis. They're not always visible, of course, because, you know, planets aren't visible during the day. Very rarely they can be. And at night, sometimes the planets aren't always out at night. It depends on where they are in their orbits. Again, that wasn't understood long ago. But what was understood is that these seven objects, the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, traveled on this little path. Those seven objects, well, they dedicated seven what we call days to them. The days of the week are named after the planets. Sunday, Monday, Sun, Moon. Okay? Tuesday's for Mars. Wednesday is for Mercury. Don't ask me how these words all came about. Uh, if you use Romance languages, they sound very similar. So, like, Martes is Tuesday in Spanish. That sounds like Mars, doesn't it? Miércoles. That's Wednesday. It sounds like Mercury. It's, it, you can kind of tell where it came from. Jueves is Thursday. Jupiter, yeah. Friday, Viernes, Venus. Saturday, Sabado, Saturn, Saturday. Obviously, you want to use Italian or preferably Latin, but I don't speak those languages, so I apologize, but that's what we're going to roll with. Now, we're going to switch over to something else to kind of show why this is the way it is. Let's look at Universe Sandbox. And let's reset this. Our sun... sits almost directly centered in our solar system. It's a little bit off because of the gravity of the bigger planets. But here we go. Let's slow this down a little bit so we can take a look at everything. There's our sun. Huge ball of gas and plasma. Hello, chat. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we're just talking about the planets right now. We're talking about our solar system. Uh, this, of course, is the sun. This is the anchor of our solar system. It's the star that we all rely on for energy and life as we know it exists because of it. Of course, there's also extremophiles that don't need sunlight, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Our solar system is set up kind of like this. Uh, the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, uh, very close to the sun. They are small, rocky worlds. Hence, terrestrial or Earth-like planets. Once you pass them, you find what's called the asteroid belt, which is kind of a leftover debris field. Uh, it's actually in three dimensions. You'll see that they don't all follow that same path. They all kind of scatter around. Then you have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the outer planets, the gas giants, or the Jovian planets. Uh, Jupiter-like planets. And then we have these oddballs out here. This is the Kuiper Belt. This is where you find Pluto and Quawar and Sedna and all the very frozen, rocky, uh, icy and rocky worlds. Uh, out past Neptune, what's called trans-Neptunian objects. What are called trans-Neptunian objects. But if you look at our solar system from the edge, you'll notice... All the major planets appear to be on a flattened out plane. Imagine the solar system is a pizza. Uh, you got the sun smack dab in the middle. It's that funny little table thing that they put on your pizza when you get deliveries. And then you got all the little different pepperonis representing the different planets. Obviously, that's not to scale, but that's kind of the idea. They all kind of go in a circle around, the, it's actually an ellipse, uh, around the sun. A little bit further on one side than the other. Let's take a look at each of these planets as I just kind of keep zooming back and forth like an idiot. There we go. 
All right, so there's Mercury. The messenger god in Roman mythology, Hermes in Greek. Uh, doesn't have an atmosphere. It's been blown away by the sun's wind, solar winds. Very inhospitable planet. Actually really hard to study as well because not too many probes can actually handle the extreme temperatures as they get too close to the sun. And uh, if you miss, it's likely going to get pulled into the sun and burn to a crisp. There's Venus, which we did look at in the planetarium software. Again, about the size of the Earth, a little bit smaller. Uh, very oddly rotating the wrong direction. And what do I mean by that? Well, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west here on the Earth. On Venus, it rises in the west and sets in the east. And that process takes about 224 Earth days, give or take, which is almost as long as the Venusian year. So not a very fun place to live, I don't think. There's the Earth. Let's actually slow this down a little bit so you can see what's called the Earth at night. You can see all of our light pollution, as it's called. The light of our, our, our cities and our towns and our roadways make these beautiful, beautiful outlines of our cities, but at night. Which, again, it's kind of cool to see, but these are also the places. There's Tokyo, one of my favorite places on this planet. It's a terrible place to see the sky. Shanghai. You can see the entire Nile River Valley. Europe, well, that's there. You can pick a big city and there you go. We'll look at the moon in a little bit. Earth-moon system. Second. Uh, out past Earth is Mars. There we go. There's Mars. The planet that we just love to study. We have multiple rovers on the surface of the planet right now uh, from multiple countries. There's Valles Marineris, Mariner Valley, which would stretch across the United States from San Francisco all the way to New York. It's about eight kilometers deep at its deepest point. The Tharsis Montes, these are shield volcanoes, no longer active on the surface. And then Olympus Mons. If you look at a map of the United States, and you look in the southwest corner, you'll see Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. Well, this volcano would fill up any of those states. Pick one, this is as big as it. It is huge. It is huge mongus. Uh, once you pass Mars, you have the asteroid belt, which we talked about a little bit ago. Let's zoom in and look at Jupiter. Now, Jupiter does rotate very fast. I missed it, so let's pause it there. That creepy stare back from the planet Jupiter. Uh, that is the Great Red Spot, which is a hurricane-like storm. It's been raging for years and years and years. Here's the interesting thing as we start to kind of... Oh, it's... Is it going to do that? Okay. Sometimes it acts a little wonky when you slow it down too much. So let's, let's actually reset it real fast. Let's go zoom in on Jupiter once again. Slow it down a little bit. And we're going to add in all of its moons now. Satellites or moons orbit around the planet. There we go. And as we zoom out, you're going to see Jupiter has a huge family of moons. All of these objects that you see now kind of making tails, those are all in gravitational orbit of this planet. Look at this huge gravity field that it has. You kind of see all these little objects making tails around it. Those are all pulled by Jupiter's gravity. Again, the four largest are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and this is actually the motion that they make as they stay in orbit around the planet, because the planet is in motion as well. Our moon does this as well. We all make these fun little loops as we move through space. It's just really cool to see it in motion. Uh, we looked at Saturn. Oh, God. We looked at Saturn in the planetarium. Let's actually look at Saturn in here. And you'll notice right away that there's no rings because it takes a lot of computing power to keep the rings going. There 
there we go gotta digitally add them in I hate the fact they're not just automatically there but that's the way they programmed it and here we go we finally have the moons of Saturn you'll notice that some of them actually track through the ring system they are called shepherd moons they help shepherd the ring system around and you'll see Saturn also has a huge free field of satellites orbiting around it some of which again form that beautiful ring system which is made of just individual particles floating around there is a moon around Saturn known as Enceladus Enceladus that uh, well it's kind of like Europa it could harbor life no one's truly sure we haven't really investigated it enough it does have geysers of water which is kind of an important thing now here's the weird other weird oddball of our solar system what do you notice here this is Uranus which does have a very faint ring system. But it's not very much, but they are there. But as it orbits around the sun, it's on its side. You imagine our planet Earth ro rotates with the, you know, up being north and down being south. Well, Uranus is literally tipped over 90 degrees. It's just like someone came and kicked it over. No one's really sure why. This and the rotation of Venus, one of the many, many mysteries of our solar system. Where's Neptune? Let's zoom in on Neptune. Neptune's over there. Where are you going? There we go. Here's Neptune. Uh, the Named for the sea god, Poseidon or Neptune. Uh, the blue color coming from, I believe, methane at a certain temperature. Very, very cold, and again, very far away from the sun. You can see the sun very, very dimly back there. As you keep going out further, well, all the particles and stuff will just disappear, and all you'll see is the sun. So once you're far enough away, it's just a little glowing ball. You don't even see our planet. And if you get keep going out further, you won't even see the sun. The sun is just one of many, 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 many millions and billions of stars and planets in our solar system in our Milky Way galaxy I should say yikes now let's come back to the Earth Moon system real fast because I didn't mention that earlier I uh, did mention that the moon was full the other night as the this is the Earth right here there's the moon way over there as the moon orbits around our, our planet uh, it does reflect different amounts of sunlight back towards the Earth. Obviously, you're only going to really see this side of the moon if you're on the planet Earth. Uh, okay, it's what's called tidally locked. It means that this side always faces us. The back side, people like to call the dark side of the moon. That's not totally true. There are time periods where the back side, or the dark side, quote-unquote, uh, gets all the sunlight, and that's actually what we call a new moon phase here on the Earth. Uh, we don't see the moon during the daytime at that point. All well, the sunlight's being reflected back towards the sun. We'll get the backside coming up here in a second. So obviously you can see the backside, which means it's getting light, so it's not the quote-unquote dark side of the moon, it's just the backside of the moon. See the Earth way back there. The moon goes through what we call phases. Dump this get to our applet there we go and you can kind of see the same thing going on here these obviously are not the scale you see the earth rotating around here north pole up there this is first quarter moon you see the bright side on the right side and as the moon orbits around you'll see it go from what's called a waxing moon when the bright's on the right side uh, to what's called a first quarter moon so one quarter of the way around our planet then you enter what's called a gibbous phase. Uh, it's not full, but it's not a crescent either. Looks something like this. And then you get to what's called a full moon phase. And when you get to full moon... The sun and the moon are directly opposite of each other in the sky. That's opposition. The sun sets, the moon rises at the exact same time. 
and then the cycle will reverse. You end up in what's called a waning moon. So every to every night after the full moon, you have the waning moon, and the bright side will be on the left side. It goes from waning gibbous to a third quarter moon to a waning crescent. So three quarters of the way around our planet. You got a third quarter moon. You see this around two or three in the morning. And then you start to see the moon rising up just before the sun does when you're in the waning crescent phase like this. And then you end up a new moon. Entire cycle we call a month. That's where the word comes from. It's the cycle of the moon. Thought you'd like to know. <laughs> Finally, let's kind of zoom out and look around. Again, not everything is permanent. Let's come back over here. As we said, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a collection of stars, gas, and dust, and planets. Our star, the sun, is just one of, well, millions of stars. As you can see here, this is what we believe our Milky Way galaxy looks like, give or take. Spiraling arms, full of younger, hot blue stars, older, colder red stars are more towards the middle, but you do see some kind of scattered throughout. And it spins through the sky like a pinwheel. Now, our galaxy is not alone. Galaxies actually exert gravitational forces on other nearby objects. There's actually something called the local group of galaxies. Which we can bring up here. Milky Way doesn't look as crisp anymore. I think that's not the Milky Way. I don't know why we're not on it. There it is. Why'd you load up down there? That's dumb. There's the Milky Way. And you see there's a Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, the Magellanic Clouds. The small and large Magellanic Clouds are actually galaxy collision remnants, and they are below the Milky Way, physically below it. So you can see in 3D space, they are actually way below the galaxy. And if you are in Australia or New Zealand or anywhere below the equator of the Earth, Southern Hemisphere, you will see them in the sky, but you don't see them in the Northern Hemisphere at all. These are all the galaxies that are actually related to our Milky Way. As we zoom out even more, we'll find that there's another large galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy. This one right up here. The distance between Andromeda and the Milky Way is 2.25 million light years. So the speed of light in a vacuum, it's constant and it's very, very fast. 3.0 tens 10 to the 8 meters every second. We just traverse that in just a click of a, of a finger, but this is 2.25 million light years. As it turns out, Andromeda does have its own little satellite galaxies as well, as you can see. There's a little one down here, got M32, and all these other little galaxies around it. But the two big galaxies, Andromeda and the Milky Way, they have a dance that they've been doing for a very long time. Eventually, millions of years from now, Andromeda up top and Milky Way on the bottom uh, will get a little bit too close, and the other satellite galaxies will either get chucked off into space, or they'll get pulled in and merged into each other, and eventually the cores are denoted by these little black dots, that's what the black holes are, you'll see that these two galaxies are going to merge together. And there'll be a boom in star formation from all the gravitational pressures. There'll also be this incredible dance of taking millions of years for these two spiral galaxies to basically cannibalize each other and destroy each other. Some stars will be chucked out into space, as you can see down here. They've got stars being released. Other stars, well, maybe they'll collide. I doubt it. There's a lot of empty space between stars. But what happens is all the gravitational forces are going to pull stars away from each other 
binary and trinary systems are going to get thrown apart. Uh, other times, maybe planets will be thrown away from star systems. It's going to be chaos. And sometimes there is beauty in chaos. You can see Andromeda tonight, if you would like. This obviously is millions of years from now, and it's nothing to worry about. The scale of our lives. But if you look carefully, you will find it. You're in the middle of nowhere. You can't actually see the Andromeda galaxy just sitting in the sky. If you're not in the middle of nowhere and you need a little help finding it, we got to go back to our friend Cassiopeia. Remember her? Two triangles? Well, we used this equilateral triangle earlier to find Polaris, right? We pointed to Polaris, made it into an arrowhead. Well, this time, just go from the tip. And you'll find the Andromeda Galaxy. It's literally that simple. This is the Andromeda Galaxy right there. The other way of finding it is a little more convoluted. Oops. But also is something good to know. Uh, there is a square known as the Great Square of Pegasus, because for whatever reason, when you think of a horse, you think of four stars, right? In a square. This is the Great Square of Pegasus. If you follow the squares, one, two, three, four, these four stars, the bottom left star, the most northeastern star, that's the star you want to start with, and you're going to go one, two, three, and count up. One, two, three. Puts you right below the Andromeda Galaxy. So you can triangulate it by using Cassiopeia or by using this weird A-shaped constellation. And that weird A-shaped constellation is actually the constellation called Andromeda. There she is. She is the Chained Maiden and daughter of Cassiopeia. You'll notice that, again, right off her belt line is what we call the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, for a long time, it was called the Andromeda Nebula, because when you look at it through a telescope, it looks like a little fuzzball. You don't actually see all these details very well, unless you have a really huge telescope or you do photos, long exposure photos to uh, bring out the details. But uh, yeah, that was an hour-long planetarium show. I want to do a little bit more, but... Sorry, chat, I have to go. It is good to see all of you in chat. I know it's chat's not on screen for everybody else, but we do have multi-stream going on, so we've got YouTube and Twitch and Facebook all at the same time, so I keep seeing different little messages, and I'm kind of answering the questions as I go along. I haven't really been acknowledging you guys, and I do apologize for that. But I wanted to get through all this data while I could, so... I hope you all had fun. I hope you all learned something in our kind of brief hour-long planetarium session. All right, we're going to try to be doing this more often. That's just been a lot of stuff going on. And as you probably heard me earlier, uh, work is summoning me. So I'm going to have to cut this a little bit shorter than I'd like. I will be back again, hopefully on Wednesday. Please take care of yourselves.